so uh, welcome uh, to this Friday's Transportation Seminar. Glad to see all of you. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member here at Urban Studies and Planning. I help co-organize this seminar. And um, before I do the introductions, I want to remind everyone that we do webcast the seminar so people can watch live on the web and then the archived versions of those seminars are all posted on the web. And because we do webcast, we have these little microphones in front of most of you seated here. And so that we ask, if you do ask a question of the speaker um, or make a comment, that you use the microphone. And basically, you need to be holding down where it says touch. So the red light should be lit while you're speaking so that people um, on the web uh, can hear. And we actually do have people who uh, watch live and archived on the web. So it's quite popular from all over the place. So without further ado, I am happy uh, to present uh, Mike Rose and George Hudson from Alta Planning and Design. And uh, Mike Rose is one of the um, alum of our Masters of Urban and Regional Planning program from two years ago, I think. Losing track of time here. Um, George is not one of our alums, but he is an alum, as you can see, uh, if you can uh, read his shirt from uh, actually my alma mater, UC Berkeley. So um, and that's, that's perfectly. Oh, oh, a duck, too. Okay. And actually, you're a duck, too, if yes. I remember correctly. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about um, trail design and planning. Got a mic on, so hopefully everything's working out. Um, my name again is George Hudson. I'm a landscape architect, and um, <clears throat> I work for a small consulting company called Alta Planning and Design, and we actually specialize in trail bike ped projects. And as a landscape architect, uh, my role is often to implement projects that are planned and master planned uh, and get them in the ground. So uh, today, we are going to be talking about the general process of planning for trails and also uh, what's involved in getting trails in the ground. And uh, so overview of our presentation, feasibility and master planning for trails, um, and then taking the, from feasibility into uh, conceptual design, permitting, construction, uh, design and construction drawings, bidding, and ultimately construction. And we're involved with all, all of these components on trails. And uh, it's a field that <clears throat> if you are a cyclist or uh, uh, with an agency, it seems every community has certain trail needs. And it's a field that's really growing. Um, there's, there's a significant amount of work nationwide uh, with trail planning and design and implementation. So <clears throat> when we start out with a uh, trail feasibility study, essentially we, we usually have an agency uh, that has an idea of taking a trail from point A to point B. And we, as consultants, are often involved in figuring out where that trail may fall on the ground. So one of the first things we'll do, whether we're master planning or developing a feasibility study, is establishing goals for the project. And these goals can be pretty broad ranged. Uh, often trails fall within wide corridors. The agency may have a vision of having this be a greenway, which tends to be multi-objective, um, having uh, transportation, recreation functions, uh, wildlife habitat values, stormwater, uh, essentially Greenways and trails are opportunities to uh, really meet multiple objectives in an urban environment or rural environment. Um, so we'll establish a set of goals with the agency that's unique to that agency and what they want to see this project become. Uh, what, with those goals in hand, we'll, we'll begin a data collection process. And uh, uh, that'll be looking at physical conditions on the ground, um, existing plan documents that we'll want to be in compliance with, um, just every component that we possibly can to get a thorough understanding of the project. And uh, then identifying specific issues as well. Um, if you have uh, different types of trails, such as an earthen trail in a national forest, it's going to have a different set of issues versus something that is 
in an urban context, such as a railway trail project. I know someone here is from the Sullivan Gulch neighborhood. Uh, you're looking at a potential railway trail project there. And that's going to have its own specific set of issues that needs to be addressed. So we'll develop uh, kind of the universe of alternatives of alignments once we have our base mapping and data collection completed, uh, where the trail might fall on the ground. And then to reach a preferred alignment, we'll develop evaluation criteria that might include such items as cost, uh, ease of implementation, uh, number of people served. We'll develop specific evaluation criteria that, are, that typically ties to the original goals and objectives that we developed, and we'll use those to screen through the alignments and uh, uh, come up with a preferred alignment. From there, we can then develop costs and uh, specific design recommendations for that alignment. So again, just a little more detail, establishing goals and objectives we work with a, our client group. Um, our clients are 100% <clears throat> public agencies. And uh, we also seek the input of the community. So there's very often public process. Just about every trail project we do, unless the client specifically does not want us to conduct a public process, we will work with the community. Uh, we'll work with various agencies, fish and wildlife. If there's environmental issues. Um, there may be a uh, uh, flood control district is real common because we're looking at uh, corridors that are going through areas that are typically undeveloped at this point in urban context. Drainage ways are common. Utilities as well. Power lines are good opportunities for trails. So we'll work with, with the community and, and agencies to uh, establish those goals and objectives. And again, that'll help us uh, develop our evaluation criteria. So data collection, um, I mentioned getting our hands on as many existing plan documents as we can that are relevant to a particular trail. This could be a neighborhood plan. It could be uh, an environmental report that was done for a project adjacent to the uh, trail corridor. Um, it could be uh, roadway improvements that are planned. Uh, city general plan usually has some general, general information that's relevant to our trail planning effort. We'll look at uh, information such as demographics. There's a trail project that I worked on in Gladstone area, uh, the trolley trail, and it turned out that that community had a 17% uh, representation of senior citizens in that area. So there's very specific needs that... that uh, that community wanted to see met on the trail. Uh, we will then conduct field work as well, going out to uh, look at the sites where these trails may go, if it's following street right-of-way, how much right-of-way is available for the, for the trail, uh, what are the physical constraints presented, topography, uh, water bodies, wetlands, creeks, that sort of thing are all relevant that will play into what, you, what can and can't be done on the site. So <clears throat> getting a little more detailed into identifying specific issues, <clears throat> multi-use trails, which typically are separated from roadways, will almost always interface with a road somewhere along the route. And um, the number of roadway crossings is, is a big issue. You can have a trail that literally the, the recreational and, and transportation benefit of that trail can be compromised by the number of roadway crossings that you have. Then, of course, there's how do you actually design a roadway crossing to be safe for a multi-use trail? And we utilize a whole host of tools to uh, uh, kind of bring about the best, highest level of safety on roadway crossing. Creek crossing and kind of falls within the same realm of environmental resource. There may be endangered species issues that we, we have to address on water bodies. Uh, there could be plants and animals present in natural resource areas that will have a very strong influence on how the trail can be laid out, how it can be constructed, even when it can be constructed. On the Willamette River here, there are certain times of the year where there are migrating salmon in the river where you cannot do any work in the normal, ordinary high water of the river. So there's actually work windows that are defined for when things can be done. Safety is a big consideration on, on any trail. 
And that uh, goes beyond what you think of in terms of uh, crime issues, things like that. Uh, and, and it can tie into the type of trail that you have. Uh, if it's a railway trail, the rail operator will have some very set criteria in, in which they'll want to see the trail designed to. Typically, a set, certain setback they'll want from the center line of their tracks, methods of separation, separation of the trail from, from the rail line. Those are key things that a, a railway trail will involve. <clears throat> and we'll often work with local police as well when we plan a trail out. And <clears throat> local police officers will know where the hot spots are for crime, what the issues are. So we'll uh, employ uh, design solutions to address uh, crime on trails. And in general, nationwide, it's been shown that trails uh, are, tend to be fairly safe places. They don't generate crime. Um, and if there's a trail area that has issues, bringing in legitimate use to that area with trail users tends to drive out the illegitimate use. And we've seen that time and time again in the work we do. But when we go out to the neighborhoods, every neighborhood views their trail as unique. And though that solution may have worked over in, in uh, southwest Portland, it's not going to work in northeast Portland because they're a different neighborhood. So it's real important for us as trail designers to listen closely to the community that we're working within and be responsive to what they're saying. We spend a lot of time out in the field with the communities seeing issues firsthand, and then working with them to arrive at design solutions to those issues. Um, and in addition to uh, kind of good design and thoughtful design in, in creating safe places, we'll get into infrastructure for public safety, which includes things like lighting, emergency call boxes, even uh, remote video monitoring as an option. Uh, for trail safety. Now, I personally have never had to employ that level of, of measure of safety on a trail. Uh, I developed the East Bank Esplanade down here, and that area prior to the trail development was uh, a pretty unsafe area of town. Folks didn't go down there. There was a lot of uh, drug activity going on. So we actually wired the whole East Bank to do video monitoring of of that facility, and in the event there was uh, significant crime on the East Bank Esplanade, we would then go to the, the route of video monitoring. Uh, that obviously has never materialized. The trail went in, it's been a great success, and, and people are using it. When we were developing the East Bank Esplanade, we did not know, you know, there was no guarantees that this investment was going to be a success. Uh, so we were kind of uh, sticking our neck out a little bit there. Um, land acquisition is always a key, key issue with building a trail. Sometimes you're starting out with a general concept of getting to point A to point B. Looking at who owns the land, uh, we'll, we'll often look to utility corridors, drainage ways, rail corridors, because those provide long interrupted areas of, of opportunity to put a trail. Uh, but often we'll be looking at private property and what types of acquisition are needed. Uh, we'll have to define that as part of our feasibility study. What are the property impacts? Even when, when we're dealing in public right-of-way, if we have a, a roadway, for example, and we're looking at uh, a roadway that may be two lanes, but the right-of-way is 80 feet wide, and we're looking for opportunity to put a trail in there, there's typically landscaping, there's mailboxes, um, there's things that, that private residents has put in their in their front yard that is actually in the street right of way. So addressing those type of issues is, is an ongoing process with, with trail development. Uh, terrain comes into play. Obviously with, with uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have to meet ADA. So looking at the, the gradients of uh, trails and, and alignments comes into play. And uh, that has a direct bearing on cost at times. And uh, so there's a whole list of, of unique issues that comes with any trail project that we begin to uh, formulate a list of issues and graphically represent those on what we call our existing conditions or opportunities and constraints diagrams. This, this project here is actually in Las Vegas area. 
and uh, follows a wash, uh, which is a drainage way there that they're in the process of improving. And down in Las Vegas, unfortunately, the, their concept of improving a drainage way is to line it with concrete. Um, but we were looking at about a six mile area here and assessing the opportunities and constraints. There's freeway undercrossings that we had to get around. There's, there's wash crossings itself. Uh, there's invasive species along this route that we would like to see uh, uh, taken out and replaced with native vegetation. So the opportunities and constraints diagram provides us with a real quick tool to bring everyone to the same page so that when we begin looking at alignment alternatives, everyone can understand what the issues are. So uh, once we have our alignments, we begin developing our evaluation criteria. And, and there's really no upper limit to the number of evaluation criteria that you can have. Um, kind of trail user experience, is it positive or negative? Uh, does it capture some of the unique features along the trail route? Um, what are the safety issues again? Is the route safe? And uh, we'll often, as we develop our, our uh, evaluation criteria, we can numerically rank them. And uh, that involves reaching some consensus about what are the important criteria, again, tying back to your goals that you develop for your uh, project has a direct bearing on the evaluation criteria and what the importance uh, of the evaluation criteria are. And this can be pretty simple, too. We can just do a plus, minus, or neutral on these and see if there's an alignment that kind of shifts to the top. Um, and uh, it provides us with a, a pretty quick means, again, of, of at least trying to get a general sense of what is the most promising alignment that uh, is out there when we look at a trail. Um, other method, methods, uh, we'll look specifically at segments of trails. We'll, we'll try to break those into logical segments or reaches. And then looking at the... Uh, advantages and disadvantages of each reach. And then uh, order of magnitude cost is a, is a big element, obviously, with any trail project. So just in general, if you know you're looking at an overpass or a tunnel to get around a major hurdle or obstacle, then your costs are going to be higher. So even at the very preliminary state feasibility work, we weigh in the cost factor early on and try to gauge that against other options and looking at the, the multiple criteria, trying to come up with the best option again. Uh, just a quick view of an alignment map. Um, and when we do these alignments as well, we uh, utilize a, a GPS unit. We'll go out depending on where the site is. If it's not obvious where you are, uh, GPS has been a great tool for us to uh, define some alignments and, and know exactly where it's falling uh, relative to various features on the ground. So once we have our alignment picked out, we begin looking at uh, what the, the trail facility will look like. And this can get into details of surfacing types, soft surface trails, uh, paved trails, permeable pavement, asphalt or concrete, and those all have direct bearing on costs as well. Um, and we'll develop uh, preliminary design concepts at the feasibility level for as many components as we possibly can along a trail. And it begins to blur the, the distinction between feasibility and master planning, which we also do for trails. Um, so we'll develop a whole host of, of graphics that uh, will aid us in communicating the concept of what this trail will be like, but then it allows us to quickly cost these items out once we've made decisions on what the trail should be built out of. Um, we'll do the cost estimate, and we get quite detailed in our cost estimates and uh, breaking it down to uh, line items, uh, such as you see on the screen there, and uh, this will, uh, again, help the client make a decision about uh, how he wants to go about funding this or phasing the project. Very often with trails, the whole project isn't built in one shot. They tend to take a long time. Um, if 
a trail from our initial feasibility to going in the ground is done in a five-year window. That's really quick. Um, I've been working on trails in the Portland area. Uh, I did the master plan for the Springwater Corridor in 1990. And uh, if you're aware, the Three Bridges project going across McLaughlin Boulevard is being constructed right now. And we have one three-quarter mile gap remaining on the Springwater Corridor. So that's been a 16, 17-year process for me personally. So um, the phasing, once we have the cost, we can begin to break it into logical segments for construction, and we'll identify appropriate funding sources as well and assist the client with uh, funding opportunities. So, And then, uh, obviously, we want our final products to, to uh, be a good documentation of our process and graphically depict our ideas. So uh, we'll wrap it into a, a final format that uh, meets the client's needs. We'll provide an electronic copy as well. Um, we'll often post these to our website for public access and uh, uh, have this as a document that uh, serves as a tool for the client for development of the trail. And we actually brought some of these along with us afterwards. If you want to peruse through them, feel free. So with that, Mike's going to talk about specific uh, implementation here of a trail project that we're actually working on now. We've got one microphone, so we have to switch. So hopefully I'm on. Somebody will tell me if I'm not working, I guess. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm going to assume it's working until somebody tells me it's not. So. Um, I know Jennifer introduced me already, but uh, my name is Mike Rose. I finished the MERT program here. It will be two years this June. Um, before that, I had a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture. So when I left this program and I ended up going to work for Alta, I was originally hired as a planner. And very shortly, probably about a month, <laughs> um, we landed a project that was implementation of a trail. And they immediately pulled me in using my landscape architecture background, and I've been doing implementation work ever since. <laughs> it's been about a, it's been almost a year and a half now, and I'm really enjoying it. Hopefully, someday it'll get me back into doing some planning work as well. But um, it's a lot of fun. So I'll talk about some of the projects that I've been working on right now. So we talked about the steps in the process, the master planning and the feasibility study, and uh, then we're moving into the point where somebody's decided, okay, we're going to build this trail. So you want to go into the conceptual design. This a little bit blurs the line between the master planning and feasibility because you do some of this already. But again, this is the, um, the early design phase. This is the illustration of your ideas. You know, you're going to use sketches, photo sims, um, not real hard line plans at this point. And the point of doing this, this conceptual work is just to convey the main ideas of what your design is. You know, where, where are things going to go? What might they look like? It's just an initial phase, oftentimes working very closely with a client to uh, discuss what the exact elements are that they want to have. To illustrate this conceptual design piece, I want to use a project um, that we actually finished the document for this project, and somebody else is doing the construction drawings for us. And I have the document here, so I will pass that out. You guys can pass that around. <clears throat> anyway, it's known as the uh, Clark County Wetlands Park. Uh, it's in, I have to say, Las Vegas, Nevada, because everyone here thinks it means it's in Vancouver. But uh, just look at that photo right there. I mean, I, when, I, when I heard we had a, project, a, wetlands pro a wetlands project in Las Vegas, Nevada, I almost didn't believe it. And I got out to the site, and I saw this, and I didn't even know this kind of landscape existed out there. The site is it's a 2,900-acre site. And what they want is, um, they told us many times, they want a world-class facility out there. So this is the site plan. It's not real easy to see on the screen. We actually have a, a larger version of it that we can roll out if you, anybody wants to look at it more specifically later. There's also some, uh, some maps in that uh, document that's going around as well. But OK, here we go. So just to try and orient you a little bit to where you are, um, the strip, which everybody knows where that is, <laughs> is this way. It's off to this side near the airport. Um, Lake Las Vegas 
is over that direction at the end of this wash, which is right out over here. Um, the, mo the, the main part of the city of Las Vegas is over to this side, and then North Las Vegas is up beyond that. Now this site, it's really amazing. You look at the plan and it looks very similar all the way across it, but it's really not. There's what we sort of identified as four distinct zones or areas within this plan. The Las Vegas Wash, that big gray arrow kind of identifying where the water is to the south. Um, the area in here um, where you can actually get right down to the water. Then there's the area over here where the channel has been cut way, way down and there's some very large cliffs over here. There's the arroyos and hills. There's all these drainages coming down from the hillside. And then there's the rocky uplands. Um, it's a very, four, four really distinct regions on the site. And I'm going to show you some pictures of each one of them. You need to really understand the context of this project to understand some of the conceptual design. So the wash, the wash itself. Um, this wash was, in, up until about 1955, it was a perennial stream. It would actually you know, dry up in the summer months or dry up in the, in, uh, in the dry months or it would only run when it was raining. And then right around 1955, there got to be enough development in the city and enough runoff that it became a full-time stream. And it's just gotten larger and larger and larger every year. As you know, there's a huge amount of growth in the Las Vegas area. Also, most of this water coming through this wash, or a good portion of it, actually comes from the sewage treatment plant, which is up on the northwest side of the site. So if you live within Las Vegas, every time you turn on your water or you flush your toilet, you're adding some water to this wash. And because of the exponential growth, the uh, rate of erosion in this wash has just been immense. And they have come up with a plan to try and curb that erosion by, using, by building a number of weirs along the wash. This, this picture down here is one of the weirs that they're using. Um, the plan, I think it's going to take like, 10 years or so to implement. It's a long period of time. And they're currently doing construction out there right now. And that's something that we have to contend with with our... Um, with our project because there's very, very large construction equipment out there. I mean, we're using dump trucks with tires the size of cars that are out there moving soil and earth around. So we have to figure out a way to get our trail around that. So this is the area I call the Rocky Uplands. You can see there's some distinct cactus species up there. Um, it's, it looks very different. There's those rocky, these rocky outcrops up in the northern part. And then the views back down to the wash. You can see in this picture down here, Way off in the distance over this way, there's, of course, a casino that is right up against uh, Lake Las Vegas. And these are the northern hills and the arroyos coming down the hill. Um, the northern part of the site looks, looks like this. And there's a number of washes and drainages coming down the site. And then right here in this photo, that is one of the big casinos on the strip. That's how far, that's how far away it is. Hopefully you can see my mouse up there. But it's a ways away. You can still see it, but you really feel like you're, you're pretty out there. OK, here's the other area of the, uh, the, the deep ravine or the cliff edge. You can see I actually walked down on this, um, on this weir. And you can see back up over here, there's this huge amount of erosion. This has been cut all the way down. And then this is a view from the top side looking down. You can see these big cut slopes here as well. This is something when you're considering these trails, we need to keep them a reasonable distance away from this, because over time, these are most likely they're gonna, going to continue to erode, and you're going to end up with less and less space. So other issues to think about on the site. Um, erosion. Erosion is a absolutely huge one. You can see uh, George standing there on the edge of another path that was done nearby this project that has been completely undercut and eroded away. Um, there was a number of rocks and riprap and soil and stuff right here. And in a large storm event, it just got all washed out. So that's something that is a huge consideration in what we're going to do in this site. Um, heat, very hot out there. <laughs> One day doing, f doing field work, uh, the reading in the car read, I think, about 112. So that was pretty much the end of our day. <laughs> Us Oregonians got a little bit hot out there, so we, uh, we cut it short. Um, there's a number of historical features out there. This picture right here, you see this. Uh, this power pole right here. This was the first power pole um, distributing power from the Hoover Dam when the Hoover Dam was built. And it runs right through the middle of this site. Geologic features up here to the north, there's these hills. There's some significant geologic features up in an area called uh, Rainbow Gardens. It's to the north. It's on BLM land. Um, there's a couple other significant geological finds. I think there's a, something they're calling a mountain on its side. It's 
Something's been twisted in some way. People who are really into rocks and geology know that site and they like that site, and that's something that we want to connect to within this process. And then water. This site's all about water. It's, it's the wetlands park. There's, and the water that's there and the erosion that's being caused, um, it all relates to the people in the city. It relates to the landscape here. And how do you, how do you tie all that together? And what I don't have on here that I wanted to add was um, dust. There's a lot of dust out there. It's very dry. So if you have you know, six or seven horses walking out there in a line or people on mountain bikes, you're going to kick up a lot of dust. And that's a concern not only in this park, but that's a concern all over the city of Las Vegas. And that's something that was brought up later in our process that uh, we hadn't really thought about. So back to the site plan again. Um, when we started this process, we were given a, um, a guidelines plan that somebody had already done. They had come out and they had identified um, some potential trails throughout this area. There were four types of trails that they wanted. They wanted a multi-use trail. They wanted a trail for pedestrians only. There would be sort of these hikes off to the side of the multi-use trail. They wanted trails for um, equestrian uses. And they also wanted uh, mountain bike trails. It's a great place for mountain bike trails. So. This, the question then becomes, where do you put these? How do you separate them? Do you separate them? How do they interact? And then also in this harsh environment with the soil, the water, um, how are you going to figure that out? So we went through a process on uh, the existing routes. Well, not, well we, we evaluated the existing routes they had, and then we actually proposed some different ones. And some of the things we were looking at for where those existing routes were included the soil type. There's, there's soils out here that are highly erosive. There's some that are actually corrosive to concrete. If you were to use concrete features out there, they would actually corrode the concrete. Um, terrain was another really big one. The floodplain, of course, was, was an issue as well. So we went out there and we either walked or drove almost all of these, all of these existing trails we were given using, using a GPS, which in fact I'm using a GPS that was software that was developed in the ITS lab here at PSU. And it's actually worked for us really, really well. So anyway, so we reevaluated re these trails, and then we actually changed them. There were some of the stuff stayed the same, but some of it actually did change. There's the key main trail is running along the south, right by the wash here, the yellow one. That's the multi-use trail. That's sort of the main trail running through the site. This is the one that, uh, you know, if you're going there with your kids, you're going to walk probably along the multi-use trail. Um, the next one that you can see here, there's a little spot of it up here that's green and another spot over here that's green. These are what we call the pedestrian trails. These are sort of these side hikes that you would take. Terrain's gonna be a little bit rougher. The surface isn't gonna be as smooth. Um, the bicyclists are gonna be kept off of there. And it gets you a little bit closer to the wash. Sometimes there's more things to see. The purple lines are the equestrian trails. Um, there's, there's a lot of potential for, for uh, horses out here. And particularly, particularly because of the, some of the long distances. Um, it's a great place for the horses to go. And then the last one is the mountain bike trails, which are the red ones here. Our original plan, <laughs> I'm running out of time here. Our original plan, or the original plan we were given, had pretty much just one long straight trail along the south of the wash, and then a few other additional mountain bike trails throughout there. Um, we went back and evaluated this plan and realized that we need to put some loops in this trail. We need to do something that's interesting so that people can have different experiences each time they come out. So. Through the use of our through our field work, we identified you know ridges out here that would be good places to put these trails on. Um, we identified arroyos or really deep ravines that are places that we want to miss, or places that we could use as a natural feature to separate something. For example, you see right here we have an equestrian trail and the multi-use trail right next to each other, and there's actually a really deep ravine that divides those. It's a really nice natural barrier to keep those things apart. You don't necessarily have to put up a fence or do any kind of grading. It just does it for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on because. Kind of running out of time here. I want to show you more about the plan. Uh, these are the trail sections that we ended up coming up with. Our plan um, that I think is going around right now, that's actually being given to an engineering firm who is actually the prime on this project who's going to be doing the construction drawings. But they're going to do their construction drawings based on the recommendations that we give them in this plan. So these are the trail sections that we recommended they use. Um, this paving material is was a was a concern, something, something of a question of do we use you know, asphalt gets really hot and sticky out there in the desert. Concrete is very expensive. It could also corrode. Um, there's also some options of some, um, like, natural, natural paving materials or binders or something that can actually bind this soil that can somewhat behave like concrete. There's some concern about whether or not those would erode. 
um, we came up with a solution where we actually um, recommended using some concrete in some areas, specifically areas that are most prone to erosion. And then we also recommended that they actually put down some samples of some sample stretches of some of these different natural um, binder materials and keep an eye on them and see, see which ones work the best and then decide which ones they might want to use. Um, okay, so the pedestrian trail. The pedestrian trail is, uh, uses small crushed rock, um, crushed refines. And the mountain bike trails, they, this is called out as stabilized earth. Originally, this was compacted earth. But going through the process and speaking to some folks about permitting, um, dust was a huge concern. So they want to see some kind of stabilized earth. So this trail is going to have some kind of soil stabilizer, soil binder in it to try and keep down the level of dust. Same thing with the equestrian, equestrian trail. In other words, a dust concern. So they want to stabilize that as well. And then here on the bottom is kind of a special special condition, there's going to be construction out there while these trails are going on. And they're potentially going to be sharing some of the nearby, some of the same routes. So um, so we've divided them up. We put a we've put a fence in between and put some distance in between these potential trucks that are out here and the, and the multi-use trail. Now the construction road is, you know, pretty intermittent. You know, when we were out there, we went out and did field work, I think uh, three or four different times when we were out there. And most times we would see I don't know, probably maybe two or three vehicles a day going up and down through this area. So it's not too often, but we do want to keep them separated because those vehicles are very large and could easily not see a person. So other park amenities. If you want to make this a world-class facility, you can't just put a trail out there and say, go. So you need to have some other things. And so we gave them some sketches and some ideas of, of what other things could be out there. Now these, um, these may or may not get implemented in the plan exactly like they are. They have an advisory group who's going to determine exactly what's going to go out there and how it might be done and what the phasing would be for that. But we felt like we had a real opportunity to sort of give a direction to this and sort of think creatively about what else could happen out there. So these are some sketches of some ideas for, um, for signage to mark the different trails. You can see we've got symbols on the rocks to direct you as to what kind of trail you're going to be using. Uh, this would be a shade structure up here, very important out there in the heat. And then this was some options for some different signage alternatives. And then also um, another important piece was, in, was interpretive sites, which we felt was important because this this site is kind of a kind of a forgotten land out there. I mean, it's not a lot of people that live in Las Vegas know about it. My my in laws live there, and they never knew this place even existed. So we need to sort of interpret what this site is about. Why is it here? Why does it look the way it does now? How did it look maybe 50 years ago? And so there's some opportunities and some ideas we had. Some of these things were. Um, Particularly this one right here is one of our favorites. This is um, like a high watermark area, <laughs> I guess. These things would be posts, possibly steel. Poss we're not exactly sure what material they would be, but they would somehow mark where the high water is, like the 100-year floodplain on this. And they would be positioned throughout a little specific area on the site. So a person could actually walk through there, specifically in the low water, and get a sense of where this water can go and where it has been. And this one is particularly in a, in a drainage area. So this kind of shows a little area where you put some rocks in and maybe sort of let that water drain through, kind of get a feel for what the, what the site is really about. I put this picture of this cactus in here just because there's a huge variety of cacti out there. And uh, a cactus garden was one of our suggestions of something to put out there. This over here is a boulder garden, a place where you could take some of the bigger rocks from the northern part of the site that um, you might not. If you came to the site from the um, from the western side, there's actually a trailhead plan for the western side of the site, and you weren't a person who felt like hiking eight miles to get to the northern side of the site. You're not necessarily going to see what the northern side of the site has to offer. By bringing this boulder garden here, we take some of the larger rocks from the north side of the site, bring them in, and you see a little more of the character of the site in one place. This piece right here is a footbridge. It's just to show that we can do some decorative footbridges to cross some of these arroyos to really make them a special place. You know, people would know the site and they could say, yeah, you know, I'll meet you at the bridge or I'm going to walk to the bridge and back or whatever. It's a really distinctive point. Um, there's another one that I don't have up here that was one of my favorites. Um, was a water use display or a water use interpretive site. Um, the idea being, I talked about this wash, you know, everything that goes down the drain in Las Vegas ends up coming through this wash at some point in time. So. And the more water that's going through there, the more erosion there's caused. So the idea of having some kind of a, 
interpretive site, maybe using some, uh, some pipes or bowls or something to show sort of the volumes of water that you would use when you were doing different things during the day. You know, maybe a small bowl for what you would use when you brushed your teeth, or maybe a bigger pipe or bowl for what you would do when you washed a load of laundry, and, uh, or maybe a, you know, a really big pipe for what you would do when you fill up your swimming pool or whatever it was. But um, to just sort of get a sense to, you know, when you're looking down at all this water coming down, where it's coming from and how you are contributing to that, you know, whether that's good, whether that's bad, and kind of what that means. So all those interpretive, interpretive sites, um, again, they have an advisory committee who's going to be looking at these, and they're going to decide whether or not they actually want, they want to use these. But um, we felt like we had a real opportunity in this, in this conceptual design phase to, to plant some ideas out there, and hopefully they'll come back to us and, and want us to develop them even further. So once you've gone through a conceptual design phase on a project, um, you want to build it. <laughs> so um, you want to do a, a bid set. You want to find a contractor. You want to get them on board, and you want to build this thing. So the steps, very simply, the steps to doing that are uh, building a set of plans, building the sections. Specifically, when we're talking about a trail. You're definitely going to need the sections for the trail. You're going to need details about the different site amenities that are out there. Um, specifications, which is like sort of a, almost like a detailed instruction manual for how to build what you see in the plans. And then also the all-important cost estimate. So to illustrate this, um, this piece, I'm going to use another project from Lake Oswego. It's called the Stafford Basin Multi-Use Trail. It's currently under construction. Um, and I'll show you some construction photos of it in a little bit. But this is, this is a design or a bid set. And I have the set here, if you guys feel like flipping through it. That's the actual set that I've been using out on site during construction administration, so it might have markups and lines and changes and stuff on it. But that's what the set would look like that they would actually build something off of. So this is the cover sheet for that project. It's located right here. If you're familiar with the area, this is Stafford Road coming down right here. And this is Rosemont Road leading down into West Lynn. So here's a context map of this site. Again, this is Stafford Road up here. This is Rosemont Road down over here. Um, if any of you know Lusher Farm, have you heard of Lusher Farm out in Lake Oswego? It's a, it's a CSA farm. Um, that's located right here. And most of their uh, crops that they grow are grown right out in here. So this trail is about a mile. Um, it's about a mile, a little less than a mile one way, if you went all the way down and you looped this thing. If you went all the way down and back, you go about a mile and a half. It's a paved trail. It's, uh, it's paved, and the uses for this are going to be um, bicyclists, pedestrians, and also equestrians. There's a horse facility down here, an equestrian facility called the uh, Rosemont Arena. And someday this trail is going to be extended probably even further, and they want this to be a place where people can also ride their horses as well. So it added a little bit of a different twist to this project. So I talked about the different sheets that you were going to need for your plan. So here's a plan and profile sheet. This is one piece of it. The Lusher Farm site is right up here. Rosemont, or, yeah, Rosemont Road is running along right here. This particular site, I'm going to go back one, happens to have two wetlands on it that aren't shown on this map. There's a large wetland right here, and there's a small wetland right here. Both of these, we couldn't build a trail through these, so we had to cross them with a boardwalk. So there's two boardwalks on this plan. We'll see some pictures of the boardwalks in a minute. So this happens to be a location where one of the boardwalks is. So here's a plan view of the trail. Going up this hillside, this was a steep slope. Um, it was steeper than, uh, we didn't want it to be steeper than 5%. 5% is where you can meet um, the American Disabilities Act requirements um, of not necessarily having, or not having to have a rail along your trail. So 5% was the magic number that we needed to stay below. To reach 5% up this hillside, we needed to actually curve this trail a bit to get enough, uh, enough grade to do that. We don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, it actually is engineered to accommodate equestrian use. Yeah, we'll show you some pictures of the boardwalk. These things, the boardwalk was by far the most expensive piece of this project. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to work myself. So anyway, so there's a plan and profile sheet. And you can see on the profile side, um, you've got an existing grade, and then you've got what the proposed grade is. So here we can calculate how much cotton fill the contractor is going to have to use. So here's sections, typical sections of the plan. Um, there's a number, I have five sections here because there's five kind of different types of sections of this trail throughout the project. There's one section that doesn't have any kind of a horse trail next to it. 
Um, there's this piece over here. From here to here is a different material. It's, it's crusher finds, crushed rock that's kind of packed together tightly. That's specifically for the use of the horses. Um, this one down here is that site in front of Lusher Farm. It had a lot of planting and it had some specific drainage in it. So here's the detail sheets. You can see uh, we tell the contractor how to plant trees, shrubs, how to build curbs, how to plant the ground cover. Um, you can see we made a change to this one right here, <laughs> and we issued a, a, a different plan for that. There was a question that the contractor had. We decided to change the way this thing was done, so we issued an addendum for that one. So when your plans, when your plans are done, they're never really done until the project is done. Things will change. So you finished your, part, your project. Let's go build it. Well, before you can do that, you have to make sure you get permits, and permitting is really important, and we learned this specifically on the Stafford Basin project. You make sure that uh, you, you find out, meet, meet very early with the appropriate permitting agencies and find out what permits you're going to need, how long they're going to take, how much they're going to cost, um, and when you can submit those things, how, how done your drawings have to be. Um, typically, you're going to need permits for, for example, like the wetland that we were going through. We needed special permits from the Army Corps of Engineers. For the grading we were going to do, we needed a grading permit from Clackamas County. For um, building the boardwalks, we needed a building permit from Clackamas County. And for erosion control on the site, we needed an erosion control permit from Clackamas County. Um, we met with everybody really early on, that pre early on in the process, showed them what we wanted to do, and then when we came back to submit for permits, they seemed to change their mind a little bit <laughs> on a few of those things. And they ended up, we ended up modifying the project um, in a couple of places to accommodate those things. Unfortunately, it ended up delaying the project about 30, about 30 days or so, which ended up pushing the schedule back far enough where we tried to build this during the rainy season, which we're still not finished, so you'll see some, some muddy photos coming up. Okay, so, uh, so you've got your permits, you've got your plans, so you've got to find somebody to build this thing. So you've got to put it out to bid. Um, pretty simply and short, you need to advertise the bid. Um, in the Daily Journal of Commerce, you'll see, you'll see advertisements for projects to be bid. Um, you'll hold a pre-bid meeting with all the people who actually want to bid on this project, tell them the specifics of this project, what the bidding requirements are. After everybody has the plans in their hands, all the contractors will sit around and try and figure out how much it's going to cost for them to actually build this thing. And at that point in time, we got a lot of questions from bidders, specifically about that boardwalk. They're very curious as to why the boardwalk was built the way it was, because it looks like it's built for an army to cross. And I'll show you in a bit. Um, then we can issue um, addendums as necessary. They uh, sometimes, you know, we'll find that there's a flaw in the plans, or the contractors something isn't clear, or we need to answer some of the questions. We'll issue that, and we'll make sure we get that out to all the bidders, so it's a level playing field. The bids will come back. They'll open the bid and simply award the contract. Um, Hopefully, it always runs that smoothly. OK, so construction. So we have a contractor on board. We've awarded the contract, and we're going to build this thing. So this is the same project. This is the Stafford Basin Multi-Use Pathway. This view that we're looking at right now, um, this is Stafford Road right along there in the back, and then Rosemont Road is sort of running to my left. This is that cut slope I showed you in the plan and profile view. and this. Dump truck right out here is dumping some soil to put on the edge of the boardwalk. So some of the first steps out there is to put in your erosion control fencing. This is an erosion control fencing right here through this wetland area. Um, this is some grading. The first preliminary grading is scraping off the soils across the top. And then here they are laying some rock and checking the, checking the slope of that. This, uh, this loop over here it brings up another important point that uh, when doing a process like this, it's always really important to make sure you have accurate survey data of your topography on your site. We ended up with an interesting circumstance on this project. Um, we were provided survey data from the city of Lake Oswego, which came from their GIS system. Well, that survey data was interpolated from aerial photographs, and we relied on that for much of this trail. And then when we went out to actually lay out this trail, we realized that in some sections it really wasn't very accurate. It was off kind of consistently by about mm, three to four feet. And the more we investigated that, we kind of realized that more than likely the aerial photography that was used for interpretation of this was uh, registering the tops of the grass when the grass was really tall, rather than actually giving us the actual elevation of the soil itself. So the solution really ended up being to just kind of lower our grades in that area about three to four feet, and it came out pretty even. But this is kind of a lesson learned. In the future, something like that, you really want to make sure you get a surveyor out there and at least you know, shoot the center line of where your trail is going to be to make sure your grades are really accurate. So here's the boardwalk I've been talking about. Um, 
you know, this was the first phase. They put up the erosion control fencing. Um, the next piece, they located these piers in the ground. And then the next one, you can see they put these steel H beams or steel I beams on here to uh, support this structure. And then lastly, over here, and they're not quite finished with this yet, they're installing the decking on top of this boardwalk. But you can see with those beams spaced as tightly as they are and the thickness of the steel and the thickness of the piers, horses are going to be able to walk across this no problem. In fact, you might even be able to drive a car across it, although we're going to make sure you're not allowed to. The decking is a material, it's a, it's a plastic lumber material. Um, I can't remember the exact, tech tech wood. was it Techwood specifically? Yeah, it's Techwood. The stuff is actually really amazing. I should have brought a sample with me today. It's really, really hard and it's really heavy. In fact, when they're installing this, um, the contractors are going through drill bits like they're peanuts. They just keep breaking and wearing out. The, the is so hard. There was concerns about um, vandalism or people carving their name into this stuff. and you'd have to spend a long time out there to make a mark on this stuff. So it should last a really long time. In fact, you know, the steel might end up rusting away before the decking does. So here's a, a trail section, just the four steps of the trail section. This is the initial grading. Here we have laid down the, uh, the aggregate base. Uh, here we have the asphalt laid down. And then this last one is the asphalt on the left. This is the crusher finds for the equestrian path. And then we have a split rail fence next to it. These are some of the amenities that are going to go out there. They're not finished yet. These are the contractors showing them off to me yesterday. This is a, a kiosk, a really, really nice kiosk that's going to go out there. It's going to include some signage. And these are the bollards that are going to go in there. We have some really nice uh, medallions that we designed. They're going to go into these bollards. So getting close to the end here. So another project I wanted to show you, and this was, when I was with Alta, this was the first design project that, that I got pulled into. And, this one was kind of interesting because it had a very, very short time frame. It was in Lancaster, California, which is just north of Los Angeles. It's about the northernmost part of Los Angeles County you can get to. It's right near uh, Edwards Air Force Base and right on the edge of the Mojave Desert. So anyway, it's called the Anagrosa Creek Pathway. And this is, this is the best uh, context photo I had of this thing. But this is Anagrosa Creek. This is the trailhead that we designed for this. This is the trail we designed for this. And this is a lake they call Lake Lancaster. This is the project we, that we, we actually designed and that was built. So we have a trail that ends at the lake, and we have a trailhead here that's disconnected from the lake. There's going to be, we're working on having a phase two, where we work our way around the, either the edge of this lake or we work our way across this lake into this trailhead. Um, by the way, the trailhead is also located right on the um, Antelope Valley Fairgrounds site. This up over here is a, is a brand new facility called Antelope Valley Fairgrounds. Lots of <coughs> big facilities for exhibits and things like that. So it makes sense to have this trailhead here. It is a good connection. And when we actually really connect this thing, it'll be an even better connection. An interesting piece of this also was some extra permitting that was required. Because this is a, a freeway. This is Highway or Highway 14, the Antelope Valley Freeway. And this trail and it goes underneath and it's going to end right here on the other side of this freeway and then eventually connect. But in order to build underneath um, a piece of property owned by Caltrans or a facility owned by Caltrans, you have to get some special permitting. And it was, uh, it was kind of a long process. We actually met with the people at Caltrans uh, more than once, talked about what they were going to need, what they required, and you know, they have the ability to say, you know, we want fence here, we want this here, and if you don't comply with what they want, they won't give you the, uh, the permit required to do so. And we obviously needed it. So here's some photos of, what, of the uh, finished product. This is the trailhead. Uh, the trailhead had parking for, was it 12 or 14 or was it even 20? I think it's 20. OK, it has parking for about 20 cars. Um, you can see we designed this in such a way that there's uh, the, the use of the curbs is limited. So the water that's in this parking lot, when it rains, actually drains off into here, into this area that's kind of a dry creek bed drains off to the side, and then back into this drainage down here at Lake Lancaster. Uh, there's picnic facilities out here. And then this is the trail along Amargosa Creek. It goes up against a neighborhood that's up against a, uh, a sound wall out here. So in the future, we've actually um, designed in stubs of irrigation to add you know, plantings and irrigation and future amenities out here on this project. But this project was definitely coming in phases. They had some funding 
that a funding source that they were potentially going to lose if they didn't use. So when they came to us with this project, they said, okay, we have this much money, we have this much time, we want to build as much of this trail as we can. And so we came out and we got this done. From the time we started this project to the time it was actually finished in the ground, I think was about eight months. It was amazingly fast. <coughs> so here's another view of the trailhead. Um, you can see, of course, it's got a restroom. All good trailheads have those, I suppose. And uh, this is a facility where they're going to show some. They're going to have some signage or something about the trail itself. Plantings and uh, what was kind of pleasing about this site when we actually went back and saw it was this is the freeway right here. And when we were out there did, thinking about this for design, we thought that this was really not a great place to be. We were putting in picnic tables and thought, you know, I don't know if you'd really want to sit there and use that picnic table. Well, when we went back out there, we, we ate lunch at one of the picnic tables, and believe it or not, it wasn't too bad. It was, uh, it was a nice place to be. The, the, views are, the views are actually pretty interesting from there. The sound from the freeway itself wasn't too bad, and uh, it came out really nice. We were really pre pleased with this uh, you might mention project. The floodplain elevation there. Oh, yeah, floodplain. <laughs> that, was a, that was a key on this project was um, this lake floods, and it will flood a lot. It will get really high. So we had to make sure that the... the um, the key piece of this was the restroom. The restroom had to be at a certain elevation so that the restroom wouldn't flood. So it was a challenge in terms of how to design and grade this parking lot for that to happen. I mean, a couple of our first iterations had the restroom up seemingly on a hill by itself to try and keep it um, out of the floodplain. And through a couple of design revisions, eventually got to this, um, this solution. And so the, the restroom is the highest point, and all the water is kind of slipping back into the floodplain. But when this does flood, Water will probably reach, I would say water might make it all the way up to probably right about here, you know, in an extreme flood event. However, the water coming through here isn't moving at a real fast rate. Um, usually it's moving pretty slowly. Um, the water in Lake Lancaster isn't actually moving. It's, 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 uh, it's just kind of sitting there. It's kind of a detention basin. So um, these plants and these rocks and everything should probably should stay in place when... Uh, and then soils. Oh, yeah, soils. Yeah, th this is also a challenge um, because of the soils. We tried to figure out what to plant out there. So we uh, took some soil samples and we brought them back to Portland with us and we, we, we planted some, some seeds in them to just see what would grow and absolutely nothing grew. So we got some additional soil samples and we had them send in for testing. And the results we got back, um, the salt content and the content of boron in this soil was so high that virtually nothing would grow in this. It was, um, we were looking at agricultural charts for, um, for plants that were really tolerant of bad soils and we couldn't find any that would actually grow in this particular environment right on the edge of the desert. So what we ended up doing in this project is actually excavating out the poor soils and bringing in soil that these plants would grow in. So you're looking at this trailhead, and I should have taken a picture farther back, but this trailhead is actually sitting on a bunch of fill and at about the top oh, I don't know, I think 12 inches or so in the areas where there's just shrubbery and then in areas where there's trees, it even goes down, I think, as far as two feet, is actually soil that was imported specifically so that those plants would grow there. And not to mention, it's also a desert environment. It does get very hot. The client was also very concerned about um, vandalism in this area because it is a little bit remote, particularly if there's nothing going on out at the fairgrounds at the time. So the... Um, the benches and the picnic tables and all that stuff needed to be very um, vandal resistant. And so getting into that, there's a number of you know catalogs where you can just sort of order concrete benches. And these, and these concrete benches are pretty vandal resistant. I mean, they've got rebar inside of them. You could pound on those things pretty good and they're not gonna crack. And you could paint them over and they're painted with a vandal resistant coating that you can go back and you can wash this stuff off. And it looks like they've actually been holding up fairly well. They've been out there. When we saw them, they'd been there for probably about six months, and so far there hadn't been any damage to them. But to try and make it a little more interesting, rather than just having a typical concrete bench, we added uh, these custom details to the benches. The, the company that made these benches would, would, uh, would take this custom art and we would tell them where to locate it on these benches, and these, be these benches were specifically cast for this specific project. So we got information about some of the native um, wildlife that was out there and we put those onto the benches. So here's uh, Roadrunner, this big one over here. This one is uh, the native jackrabbit, and then there were two others of uh, coyote and 
a hawk, yeah, and a hawk was the other one. And these actually turned out really, really nice. I mean, we're really glad it, it adds a little extra to this to this project. It really sort of ties it to Lancaster rather than you know wherever else these benches might be located. Mention That's good. Yeah, and that's the other thing. If you look at where these benches are located, you can see right over here. This is the edge of the pavement, and then this is the edge of the uh, the bench. And then there's the same thing over here. A consideration and a concern was that people were going to come out here on their skateboards and they were going to jump up on the edge and they were going to rail slide down these benches and they were going to chip up the edges of the benches. Well, it doesn't show quite as well as I'd like in these photos. I needed a sort of a different view of it. But we specifically positioned these benches far enough away from the asphalt or from the, uh, from the concrete and within this, uh, this decomposed granite material that they're sitting in that somebody on a skateboard isn't going to be able to get there. They're just not going to be able to roll up to get to it. Um, and even if they did, they you know they'd make it once and they'd fall in the they'd fall in decomposed granite and they wouldn't be able to roll any further. So um, you've probably all seen those those little clips that you know people put on walls and benches and things all over the city to try and prevent people from uh, skateboarding on them. In fact, I think there's a whole bunch of them right right out here. Um, this was this was a design solution so that you wouldn't have to come back and retrofit something like that or even plan that into your design in the first place. And you can see the benches have held up fine and with. Uh, with no signs of damage, but if you want to skateboard on the trail, you can do so. You're just not going to be able to break the the furniture while you're out there. Is there anything else you want to mention on this one? No. Okay. I think that is that is it for uh, today. So um, we ha I have my website address up there. If you want uh, to find out more information about you know the trails work that we're doing, some more information specifically about these projects, you can go to the website. Um, you can access uh, my email and George's email also from our website. And if you're really into this stuff, we have a quarterly newsletter that comes out that you can subscribe to as well. And we can take questions now and if I you like. I want to remind people when you ask questions to use the microphone uh, in front of you so the web viewers can hear. <coughs> okay. I just got a couple of questions about the funding sources that um, you mentioned that there were some funding sources. Uh, that were expiring? Were they federal grants? Were they, uh, if you could chat just a little bit about where the money came from, particularly, for example, the large uh, Las Vegas park and that sort of thing? Um, the, the funding for the um, Amargosa Creek Pathway, I believe, George, that, that was a, a grant through, was it through Caltrans, actually, that that one came from? State, State Fish and Wildlife. Oh, was that one was State Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it was a grant through State Fish and Wildlife. Um, they had gone through a public process, a public design process. There was a number of public meetings. They came up with a conceptual plan for this um, for this trail, and then they submitted for the grant and won the money for the grant. I think the grant itself was about five hundred thousand dollars, somewhere around there. And but it had a time frame on it, so they got the money, but they had to actually implement whatever they were planning on implementing with that money within, I believe, it was two years from the date they got it. And when they called us. Or when we we actually got that contract, they had about eight months before uh, before that was up. So they had to design and get this thing in the ground very quickly. Um, funding for Wetland Wetland Park in Las Vegas and George, help me with this if I'm if I don't have the specifics of it. But the funding for the Wetlands Park is a little bit different in Nevada. Nevada has a whole lot of BLM land, and um, a certain portion of sales from the BLM land is pulled into parks funding for. Um, for sites and cities in Nevada. And basically, that's pretty much where that funding comes from. I know they have some other smaller funding sources mixed in with that, but mostly it's proceeds from the sale of BLM land within the state of Nevada. And that's, from what I understand, that's pretty unique to the state of Nevada. Lake funding for Lake Oswego? Um, that's from the, uh, their, their parks, and recs, uh, parks and Recreation Fund that they, use for, that they use for the city. In fact, there's a, I should have a picture, a sign of it. Uh, there's a sign out there that's Stafford Basin Trail. Your tax your tax dollars at work, or your funding at at work. So it's just part of the uh, general parks fund. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you do any sort of like a feasibility study, like to weigh benefits and costs for each of the trails. I'm sorry, for what, each of which? The trails that you propose, do you do any sort of like a feasibility study, like to weigh benefits and costs um, proposed to your clients? Well, yes. I mean, George George talked about that um, initially when we came in. These last projects that that I was talking about, um, for example, like the 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 Stafford Basin Trail, there had been a feasibility study done on that previously, 
and we came in in the implementation phase of that. We were given, in fact, there was already a uh, uh, a permit. There's a land use permit specifically for a trail that was already in place. It was issued by Clackamas County. So when we came into that project, we were given a piece of land that you know, and they said, okay, build a trail, and we want. You know, we want a hard surface. We want it to accommodate horses, and we're willing to cross the wetlands and pay for the boardwalks. Now, in terms of cost of that design, when we were working through the design, we did talk about different options of cost for building that thing. I mean, obviously, there were some other boardwalk solutions that would have been far cheaper. Um, those boardwalks they're looking at um, combined, I think, is over $160,000 for those two boardwalks alone. And those, that's very expensive for for a piece of this trail. That's uh, it's over. It's so over a third, I think, of the entire project budget was just going into those boardwalks. So through the process, yeah, we did talk about the cost of different materials. We talked about different kinds of fencing and, and what that was. And then in the wetlands park as well, we did the same thing. We didn't come in in the very early feasibility study phase of that, but we came in more in a conceptual design phase right in between going out to um, actual construction documents. So we did talk a lot about material costs, particularly in the kind of paving surfaces that you could use out there. Um, Using concrete is far more expensive than using asphalt, and uh, using even colored concrete that we talked about is even more expensive than that. And then some of these binding solutions um, can be less expensive, but they can erode away faster, and they maybe need to be maintained more often. So there's a number of trade-offs throughout those. So we do talk about that with our clients through each one of those. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, George? Well, I, I don't know if you're talking specifically about cost-benefit of trails, but that often is a component of our feasibility work where we'll actually project the number of people that have used this and how much it's going to cost and what the cost is for the number of users. Um, and that's a tool that assists the agencies with funding as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, in terms of the more urban trails, it um, seems often trails run into opposition from some of the adjacent property owners in terms of like concerns they have about privacy or crime, you know, right right or wrong, sometimes these things come up. Um, how do you address those? You know, I'd like to default to George on that one, because the, the trails specifically that I've worked on at this point, fortunately we haven't run into a lot of those issues. So, and George, you might want to push the bed on one of those microphones. There you go. Uh, that's in terms of crime, concerns from adjacent neighbors. Uh, that is prevalent in every trail we work on. Um, how do we address that? Uh, we take a real proactive approach, approach to that through our design process. And that, um, first of all, working on these projects nationally, we know trails tend to be safe places. They don't increase crime. They tend to have a, a general benefit. Uh, property owners actually like them once they're in. It's a matter of getting to that point of having them in the ground. So um, good design, keeping as many eyes on the trail as we possibly can. Often property owners will say, I want a fence because I'm going to lose my privacy. Uh, we tend to discourage that. I think the best solution for something like that would be to say, let's see what transpires once we build a trail. If there's a need for a fence, we can come, come in at any time and put one in. But if you're going to have a fence, what, what will that fence look like? We actually would like to maintain as many eyes on the corridor as you can get. So rather than building a solid wood fence, you're better off putting in something people can see through. Because otherwise you're walling off the trail. The, the Amargosa Creek Trail that you saw there with the sound wall, horrible situation. Uh, you really don't want to do that. And we were kind of given that situation. Uh, I never recommend putting in a solid fence. Um, where do you place things like benches? Uh, generally, if you take a bench and pop it out in the middle of nowhere, it'll be used seldomly. And if it is used, it's usually by some person that wants to sleep there or sit there and, and drink a bottle of port or something. <laughs> so generally, look real carefully at where you place things along the trail, activity areas, where, where it's going to be seen and used. We also work with local police, as I mentioned. They'll know where the hot spots are on trails uh, and what the issues are, and then we'll try to come up with specific design solutions for that. It's working just last month on a trail in Dallas, uh, segment of trail that was missing, 
It was the toughest trail project that they had in Dallas, and they actually brought us on to figure out where this trail should go and how it should be designed uh, from a safety point of view. When we showed up to look at the site, there's a major arterial with a creek underneath it, and the trail, the route would follow the creek and go under this major arterial. Well, over the major arterial was an interstate freeway. So you had two layers of freeway underneath the, uh, the <coughs> arterial of the freeway. It was so dark that no plants would grow underneath there. And there were so many empty 40-ounce bottles of Budweiser. I was amazed. Bud Ice, that's the, the drink of choice there. Uh, we actually recommended uh, fiber optic illumination underneath the, the bridge deck of, of the major arterial. And then also core drilling in light wells that would, would just have a, a metal grate manhole cover on the, on the light wells to allow light penetration in through there. And then you want to energize the space as well uh, with some activity. So we recommended underneath the freeway uh, utilization of some of the space. There's a large parking area there for an open public market, like a farmer's market. But then also, let's integrate a skateboard park in down there to bring people down in there. Because uh, once you start generating a certain amount of synergy, that, that bad activity tends to move out. Uh, but the adjacent neighbors still are going to have the concerns. I and mean, we can throw out as many design solutions as we can. Uh, my experience is that the people who live immediately adjacent to the trail, they're going to oppose it. The vast majority are going to oppose the trail. The ones that live one house away from the trail, they're in support. So through our public process, we will often do written surveys that will go out via utility bills, website postings, public meetings, we'll distribute them. We will literally get uh, two, 3,000 surveys back. From that, it'll tell us we have, say, 70% support, 80% support for the trail. We know where the opposition is. What that survey does, in addition to providing us useful information in terms of what the user needs are, Politically, you go to the city council and you say, okay, we're ready to adopt this master plan or build this trail. Council has to approve it. They want to know there's majority support. So by having that survey in hand, the council members are comfortable voting on it then. So it's just how do you, how do you approach it politically as well to get it through? So we use a whole host of uh, approaches. Uh, in addition to, to good design, we'll look to program the space with activity, uh, maybe a running event. Uh, we'll also look for volunteer opportunities. Eagle Scouts are always looking for opportunities to build bridges, put bridges, things like that. Once you start getting that sort of community buy-in, uh, the community begins to embrace the trail, and that's where you're headed towards success. Uh, formation of friends groups is always a, a, a real plus if we can do that. Um, and that'll establish a real strong basis for, for ongoing support watchdog program for the trail. Uh, so there, there's really a whole host of, of ways of approaching safety on a trail uh, that we employ. Um, pretty thorough approach. There. So. Other questions? Yeah. I have two questions. Um, what was the land ownership for the Lake Oswego Trail, and what was the experience with acquiring that land? And then also, um, how do you pick pick projects? How do you choose them? Want to answer the latest yeah, <clears throat> um, fortunately, um, when we were pulled into that project, um, the portion of the trail that you see that was built, the city of Lake Oswego owned that land, so they were, you know, they were able to pretty much, you know, they were able to just do what they wanted. They still had to go through some land use permitting to be a, allowed to put a trail on there, but they did own that land. They didn't have to acquire extra ownership. However, originally that that plan um, called for about another. I don't know, eighth of a mile of trail. Actually, they're supposed to go a little bit beyond that on the southern end where you see. And there was some concerns there. Um, there were some private landowners right there, right there at the edge of the trail. So we could. The, 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 it wasn't a question. They, they couldn't really purchase the land from those specific landowners. They didn't really necessarily want to leave. Um, in some cases, it would have been very expensive to do so. So the trail was actually going to be kicked down into the right of way of the road, and it was going to go right along parallel to the road. Um, for at least a small section until we could find a place where we could come back in. So, so in answer to your question, the piece that's built, the city of Lake Oswego already owned it. The piece that we did end up not building, there was going to be some tricks and some concerns about getting around. And we did talk about some issues with some um, 
with potentially buying a piece of property um, to put this trail on or some land swap with the city to, uh, to try and get that to work. Do you have more to that? The, the Lusher Farm site, which was the main piece in Lake Oswego, is actually purchased by the Three Rivers Land Conservancy. They're a nonprofit in, in, located in Lake Oswego, and their mission is to acquire land and hold it for recreational or other purposes into perpetuity. Um, so they were actually partners with the city, and they actually handled the acquisitions in that area. Um, and we're actually we're looking at continuation of that trail all the way now into West Lynn, and they're our client on that. So they're very much aware of uh, the land ownerships, the costs of ownership, uh, acquisition of that land, and acquisition techniques. Because you don't have to buy it; be simple. You can secure an easement, obviously, um, and then. In looking at the extension of the trail as well to West Lynn, there's a lot of that land that's out of the urban growth boundary, but we see it coming ultimately into the urban growth boundary. There's a lot of pressure for that. We see that as a trigger for opportunity to continue the trail because as development permits come in, um, it is feasible to require dedication of land to open space, protection of natural resource areas, creeks, riparian, forested areas, things like that that would then present an opportunity to, to put a trail into these developments. Uh, so Three Rivers was a partner on that, and they were instrumental. Your other question was, how do we pick our projects? Um, well, as trail specialists uh, and trying to, trying to do high quality work, I've been doing this with Alta for going on six years now. And I we get a lot of word of mouth business now. <laughs> Clients know that this is what we do, and, and trail work agencies are recognizing that as a specialty area now. And uh, if there's a trail project that they have, they often will call us directly and tell us that they have a trail project. Uh, we also did a, a national level study. It's a railroad trail uh, state of the art uh, manual, essentially, on how to develop railroad trail projects. And that's led to a lot of national work for us with railroad trail projects. Um, we're looking at a large one up in Seattle right now that's over 40 miles in length that's a, a railroad trail uh, study. Um, so we, in terms of us picking projects as well, we obviously have a certain kind of core value to our company of, of doing projects that improve the livability of communities and enhance the environment as well. So when we see a project like that, we will pursue it as well. So. Just a, a whole host of approaches to, to landing work. They don't move anymore. <laughs> what kind of cooperation do you get from the railroads on those? Do they do they chip in for um, any part of it, uh, or do they just come up with requirements? Um? Uh, with railroad trail projects, it's it's real variable. Um, there's different types of railroads. And I know the Sullivan's goal, that's Union Pacific. Right. They're, they're the big boys in the US. Uh, and it's going to vary project to project depending on what type of rail is, is being operated there. What are they hauling? How important is that line? Uh, lots of rails go through an abandonment process. If they're in that process, it obviously makes things easier. If it's a uh, heavily used uh, major hauler like Union Pacific, they're going to uh, dictate what goes on in their corridor completely. Um, cooperation, the, the class three operators like Union Pacific, um, they are going to want money. Um, they're going to they're gonna throw out every safety issue they possibly can. In general, they, they're not cooperative. It's, it's an uphill battle. It's, it's a challenge dealing with, with the larger haulers like that. Um, we're dealing with Burlington Northern right now down in Southern California. Um, Burlington Northern out of the Port of Los Angeles is the main hauler for Costco and Walmart. And you can imagine the number of trains they run out of this facility. They, they run over 60 trains a day that are some of the longest trains I've ever seen that is hauling all this goods made, from, made in China that we're all buying here. <laughs> Um, I actually see that as an interpretive opportunity on this trail I'm working on down there. <laughs> <laughs>
But um, uh, so what are they hauling? How many trains? How fast they're moving? These are all going to have a bearing on, on what the rail is going to want. Uh, generally, they're going to have standards that they're gonna, going to immediately throw out at you. They're going to tell you that they are not in the business of providing trails. They're opposed to it as a general policy, no trails in their right of way. But then they're always willing to discuss it. it. It'll always be, okay, we'll need this amount of setback, and we may be triple tracking this section of, of trail in the future. So you have to consider what their long-term operational footprint of their facility is going to be, see if you can meet their setback. So what we'll do is get their criteria, we'll go out with, with a tape measure, we'll measure the space available for the trail, and it, it may be, in most cases, we can we can meet it maybe 75, 80% of the time, uh, what their specific criteria setbacks are and separation techniques. But those last 25%, those are the ones that can kill your project. So what we'll do is come up with a series of alternatives for that. Design treatments, separation techniques, uh, maybe all alternate routes that have to go on street for short, short segments, those type of approaches. Then we'll go back to the rail operator and say, okay, here's what we can do to meet your, your standards. Here's where we can't meet it. We really need your help on how we can approach this. And uh, they'll always be thinking, what's the bottom line dollar amount as well? Because they know they're going to be selling some sort of easement to you as a public agency. I'm also uh, working with a client out of uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it happens to be the city attorney for Coeur d'Alene. And he was the Union Pacific uh, attorney for 20 years before he left and became the small town attorney. And he has railroad trail projects all over Coeur d'Alene now because he knows the ins and outs of the liability of the railroad, and in particular, at grade crossings of rail lines with trails. That, that's just like forbidden territory for most people. He's got them all over in Coeur d'Alene. And he's, he's told me that he has defended so many cases in behalf of the railroad as, as UP. That liability falls completely on the local jurisdiction. And he knows that inside and out. So he goes in with very simple design solutions. He's not afraid of pushing the envelope with the rail line because he knows the local jurisdiction has that liability, not the rail line. So he's been able to do some really amazing things there that most agencies wouldn't even think about. One, one at grade crossing of rail, railroad line, if you put in all the bells and whistles the rail is going to ask you for, it's a, it's a quarter million to $300,000. Um, the grade separated or the grade crossings that that Coeur d'Alene's been doing are, are probably under five thousand so, um, dollars. So it's it's its own unique challenge dealing with the rail line. Um, we just looked at a project yesterday down in Fremont that that has BART going in and freight going in the corridor. But we believe we can get a trail in there and we can swing the deal with them. So. Uh, Knowing what the rail operator needs is, is part of it. Often they'll already have trespass issues. And our research shows that if you formalize a trail and do it right, that trespass is reduced. The liability on the rail line is reduced. Um, and uh, there may be need for like track upgrades, uh, things like that, that can be dovetailed into uh, a railroad trail project, and all of a sudden the rail, rail operator is kind of looking at it. I get paid to, to get rid of this this area of land that I'm really not using. I'll have a maintenance road I can access my line on. Um, I can solve this trespass issue that's been a thorn in my side, and I can get some, some good brownie points for the community. So they'll start to see the benefit uh, of it, but it's a long process, and you really have to work closely with the, with the rail operators on it. As soon as you possibly can, yeah. Uh, the worst thing you can do is plan out your whole trail and then go to them with your plan. They'll just look at it and throw you out of the room. <laughs> so, yeah, the sooner you can bring them on, uh, even at the concept stage, uh, and let them know what's, what you're thinking. They're going to immediately tell you you can't do it. But uh, <laughs> Some people have a hard time even figuring out who to talk to. Yeah, yeah. We need uh, a 
we need to wrap up. Yeah, okay. So this conversation can continue after our formal time um, because we are at 1.30. And um, if you're a student, check in with me to make sure I got you here. And I, I, I will mention that back in April 2003, we had Mia Burke come to this seminar and do uh, talk on rails with trails. And you can actually watch that online back in April 2003. And then I believe the document is on your web page um, as well. Great resource. And then I also want to uh, plug next week's uh, topic. We have uh, Professor Jan Sperling from the University of California at Davis. And he is going to be talking about oil and the internal combustion engine, end of an era, with a question mark there. It will be a somewhat provocative uh, discussion that I invite everyone to. And I want to thank our speakers, and again, I'm sure they'll answer some more questions.